We're literally under attack. Oh, man. <laughs> ah! <laughs> ah! 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 All right, Tim, an idea for a podcast. How about this one? You'd call it something like Islands or Castaway, and every single episode is set on a different island somewhere in the world. So our intrepid host or hosts one day could be in some exotic island in the Pacific Ocean and then some stormy island off the coast of Wales, things like that, episode on episode. And before I talk about this idea, I should point out we're kind of trying it today because today Tim and I have come to an island in the Bristol Channel called Steep Home or Steep Home and we're going to be here well, all day, basically. I think we're going to be here for something like nine hours. I know. Which is a fair while once you get here. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is. Basically, this little island in the channel that we'll talk about more throughout the episode is not open to the public, kind of, except on special days when they bring people over. So today they've brought about, I don't know, about 40 people or so over in three little boats. And we all jumped off and ran up the beach and ran up the stairs up onto the island and now we're here for the day. And we are kind of trapped because you can only get on and off the island at certain times due to the tide. The Bristol Channel has this famously extreme tidal range. So we came up onto the island at high tide and then we have to get back off the island at high tide. And there's no going nowhere. We're here on this desert island. Here we are. So we're thinking about building a fort and... Starting a garden and bunkering in for the long winter. Yeah, we've got our, we've got our uh, volleyball called Wilson or whatever that's happening. <laughs> You're my Wilson. I'm your Wilson. <laughs> How would you describe this island to someone who's n- knows nothing about it? And you didn't know anything about it really until today. Just paint a picture, Tim. Well, if, if you said, there, you know, well, as you did say, we're going to an island. I would, I'm in, in um, off the English coast. I'd imagine something very green and lush. But, of course, it's summer. This is actually quite arid. It's very stony and arid. It's very beautiful coming up on it, on the boat. It just looks gorgeous. There is a lot of vegetation. Like There's a lot of vegetation on this island, but you're right. It's sort of not, it's not really like sort of lush and verdant. No, it's, it's well, and a lot of it's yellow as well um, because there's there's not a lot of water on the island by the looks of it. And then, of course, there's ruins and rocks and things and from batteries and things from wars and old cannons laying around. And that's interesting. But there's also a humongous amount of seagulls flying overhead. And you can probably hear them, hundreds of them, just circling around oh, the yeah, island over yeah, the top yeah. of the thousands, thousands even, I would say. I mean, we're right in the height of kind of the breeding time for them, so they're all making a right racket looking after their babies and stuff as well. The thing about Steep Home, and the clue is in the name, for me, is also how dramatically it rises from the water. There are a few little islands dotted through the Bristol Channel. In fact, our next door neighbour's one called Flat Home, which is quite a, quite a flat island, like a little pancake in the sea. But Steep Home is like this big jagged tooth that's almost as high as it is wide, it seems, in some ways. So it, it's really dramatic. Like even when you see it from the coast, it's, I've, I've always been fascinated by it because it sort of sticks out of the sea in this really dramatic fashion, like the peak of a peak of a hill or mountain poking out from under the water. So... Getting up onto it has been something that's always been really interesting to me. It's like it's almost entirely surrounded on all sides by like cliffs. It's basically all cliffs. There's only one little beach where these boats are able to deposit us and then we can climb up some steps and things to get up up the cliffs and up onto the island. So it's very dramatic looking. I was as I joked as we pulled up in the boats, I was looking at the cliff face and thinking this is going to be like from the guns of Navarone where we're going to have to shimmy our way up the cliff face to get onto the island. So we're going to walk around the island for the next hour or two and I guess we'll talk a little bit about it but we'll also have some pod our usual podcast ideas as we go but let's talk about my island idea Tim what what do you think about a podcast where say two people say like you and I did different episodes on different islands every week or every month or something like that do you think that's something that would have legs or would it get a bit repetitive or well it depends what you're talking about I mean there is something interesting in knowing how many you know the different islands and particularly if they're dramatically different you've got a Caribbean sort of island then you've got off the coast of Scotland or something like this and they you know and you can describe them but there's 
I guess there's a nature idea in walking around describing the island and the uniqueness of how it's here. Has it ever been inhabited? I mean, you were looking something like where we are today. There's a history of a small spiritual community, a priory going back from the 12th, 13th century, and then there's, you know, wars and different parts. So that's there's a, there's a podcast to be made in exploring that kind of stuff. Hmm. But there's also the other kind of desert island or island sort of idea, which is the sort of analogous idea of what would you take to a desert island and you know what I mean if you were Mm. here what would you want to have or how would you live on a desert island and that's a bit of a fantasy idea I guess isn't it and there's conversation in there about life and your priorities and things you like are you much of an island guy like I don't know I've never really thought about you in this way but now I think about it more than I realized you're probably quite an urban guy you're more of a city dweller you're not you're not such an outdoorsman, are you? I mean, I know you like being outdoors, but like, I don't f- feel like you're a guy that's going to enjoy being stuck on this island for nine hours. I feel like after a few hours, you're going to want to, you know, watch a movie or read a book or, I don't know. You- yeah, I, th- th- that's true. My favourite island is Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Apart from Australia, our island home. Yeah. But yeah, I guess that's probably true. I like, I do like going out in the fresh air and all that sort of stuff, but I like it as, oh, that was a lovely day, now let's go. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, I'm I'm a city dweller too, but I think maybe I'm a little bit more willing to spend a lot of time doing something boring. Like, I would quite happily get my camera and go photographing things for like seven or eight hours, but I feel like, oh, I don't think Tim would enjoy that very much if you just had to put up with me. Because tr- tr- I'm willing to wait two hours for that perfect photo of a seagull sitting on that rock and things like that, but I feel like maybe you're someone who's like, yeah, this is nice, I like this. Now what? What's next? So, so maybe I'm, maybe you're not the guy to make this an island podcast. No, no. I'm, I'm happy with you. I'm happy to sit there and read a book while you do that. That's great. <laughs> Have a coffee. Yeah, it's a little bit different. But you, I mean, you, you go off on adventures and this sort of stuff, don't you? You go to Everest and you go yeah, all over the world yeah. to Antarctica, as you've done. I don't think about, oh, where could I go next in that way? I think about urban environments and cities and stuff like that if yeah. I'm, when I think about travel. I love it. I, lo- I, I really love like I love it here. So at the mo- where we are at the moment, we're at this little kind of we're si- we're sitting in the shade of some kind of little battery or military fortification because because this island is so strategically placed in the Bristol Channel, kind of guarding Bristol from anything that may come in from the Atlantic. This island has a long history since the 1800s of being used as sort of a military base, and there are ruins of military barracks and old cannons and things like that that are gradually being swallowed by. The vegetation, but the trust that's responsible for the island is trying to keep them, keep them alive, and keep them looking as good as they can for people to come and enjoy. As you can hear, the the birds have very much made them a home of their own. There are there's there's bird poo over absolutely everything. There are dead birds absolutely everywhere because we're we're in the middle of a heat wave in the UK and the birds have been struggling. So you've got to watch where you step for dead birds, but there's also also plenty of alive ones. I'm keen to have a look down. To our left, underneath this military thing, it's got steps, old stone steps that go down and seem to go into some sort of fort that's partly underground or into the cliff face. I'm keen to, I'm keen to explore that. Yeah, I think there's like a basement down there that they used to keep ammunition in, so we can go and have a look. Or again, it's you know, you seem to be more intrigued by the human-made things that are on the island, like the old priory and the military stuff. Whereas I'm really into like the cliffs and the animals and like the geology of it but maybe that's a reason that like this podcast would work with two people like that so every island you go to you've got like your nature hound who wants to just talk about the deer that's on the island and the way that the sea has eroded it and then you've got your cultural presenter who's like oh this is really interesting let's go and visit the old church that's on this island yeah that's true i do like the built environment much more i'm more intrigued by it the island podcast would be good because sometimes you could do something that's very deserted and very inhospitable, but other times you could do a Manhattan or like, you know, Tasmania or something like that. You could do like, you could throw in a curveball. People could also request places where maybe they can't go or they can suggest you go, go to this, it's the fourth island across from the edge of, you know, this Mm. point in Canada or something like that. There's this particular there, and you could go and search yeah, it out and yeah. talk about it if that's of interest. Island hopping would be a good name for the podcast, wouldn't it? Island hopping, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Or oh, island podding? No, island hopping. Tim's looking a little bit suspiciously at the birds because they are looking at... They've gotten used to us <laughs> being here now, and now they're being like, hang on, who are these guys, and are they here to steal my eggs? And Tim has has confessed that he's not 
entirely comfortable with birds due to some due to a childhood incident. <laughs> so he uh, he's a bit worried about being swooped. I think so. But they're seagulls. I know they're not going to swoop. They're just. I mean, we have seagulls all over the oh, place. There are birds that swoop on this island. It's part, and when you read the like the warning information, there are certain places where they say make sure you wear a hat because you could get swooped here. Oh, let's I just, probably shouldn't have told you that. Let's just pretend they're all uh, <laughs> they're all seagulls, and if we had hot chips, they'd all be all over us. But we don't have hot chips with us, so they're all. It's just like being at the seaside. They are actually very beautiful, and they are all peppered all over the the sort of cliff face around about us and stuff. Oh, it's fantastic! Like the, the, seriously, we're like there are just birds everywhere. When we first got to the island, and it was like circled by a thousand seagulls, the first thing Tim said to me was, "Someone must have some hot chips somewhere on this island. <laughs> <laughs> you don't see seagulls if there's no hot chips." So, what's more in this? This is a, really a Islands. You're not thinking about there is, and we have to mention the classic, you know, desert island discs, very famous British radio show and podcast about what you would take to an island in terms of songs. Yeah, yeah. There's no, it's not that. None of that is no, in this idea for no, you. No, no. This is more. My idea is more. It's basically a travel log, travel type podcast, except with this kind of structure or restriction that you're always on an island. Oh, it's kicked off again. There are some birds having a fight. Like, well, careful, man, this one, it's going to swoop. Watch out, man. <laughs> <laughs> there are a few factual things you could explore as well, like what is the smallest habitable island? Um, the most remote they... the most remote island and things like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You Hot. can buy islands, can't you? Is yeah. that right, like real estate? You're on an island that's been bought. This island was put up for sale, and this trust, this nature trust, it's called the Keith Allsop Trust, I believe, named after this conservationist slash journalist, he died, and they, in his memory, they wanted to conserve something, and they didn't even know what they wanted to conserve. And this island came up for sale, and the trust bought this island and have made this their their project. Oh, right. I'd love to own an island. <laughs> I would. I would. It. I would really love to own an island. There's something about you. It's, it's a. It's a like a kingdom, and you can. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if you can get them cheap enough that like normal people like me. Like, I wonder if you ever get them for like house prices. Obviously, it's not going to be like a luxury Caribbean island, but I wonder if you can get some rubbish piece of rock somewhere off in the middle of nowhere where someone will say, oh, yeah, you can have that for £50,000 or something and you could just buy an island. And that's Brady Island. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I'd call it that. Harren Land. I would call it Brady Island. You would call it Brady Island. <laughs> <laughs> what would you call an island if you bought an island? I don't know. I'd just call it Island. Island. <laughs> Ireland or Ireland? Ireland. <laughs> Ireland. Yeah. Or Australia too. That's good. I mean, I'll tell you what island I'd love to really go to. Island, num- is it Nubla or Numbla? Where Jurassic Park set. Oh, right. Whereabouts is that? Which continent? Well, in the book, it's off Costa Rica, isn't it? But I don't know where oh, they... Yeah. I mean, most of the film was filmed in Hawaii, but I don't know what, where they filmed the exterior shots of the of the island. I, lo- I still love those um, chopper shots, the helicopter coming through and the music oh, playing as yeah. they go through oh, there and yeah. it lands. Nice. Nice. It'd be cool to do that every single day. Of course, you need a helicopter to do that as well. You would need a helicopter. Well, can... I, I wanted to bring my drone here today, but because of the... Uh, all the birds, it's like peak bird season. You can't put a drone up because it's really disruptive to them and there's a peregrine falcon here and stuff. But I was talking to the lady from the trust and she said maybe if you come another time when the birds all leave, in, a, in, a, in about a month or so the birds actually all leave and then maybe she'll let me put a drone up and get some drone shots because this island would look awesome from the drone. So where, where do the birds go? Just back to the mainland. What, what, where do birds go? Don't the birds fly south or something? Isn't that? The... But not all birds do that. Like, do seagulls do that? I don't, I don't know. know. Maybe they just don't. Maybe they just fly around less because they're not so worried about their babies. I don't know, man. You're asking me technical questions here that I don't know the answer to. Well, you you were reading that little book before. I assume you know all this stuff. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't really get to the the natural history part. Do you want to go down these stairs and have a look in this basement? Let's have a look. Should we keep the Should we keep the recorder rolling while we Let's do it? Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. You lead the way. So here we go. There are stone steps, and they're kind of broken with fragments and bits and pieces. It's getting echoey, easy, damp as we come down. A low roof. Okay, oh yeah. And we go in. Oh, it's dark. Hang on. And immediately cold. I'm going to get my phone out so we've got a torch because it's getting really dark now. This is cool. You can see all the bits where you'd be doing some defence with a rifle or something like that. So this is this, this is this stone battery that's on the cliff overlooking the Bristol Channel and now we're underneath it. We're definitely below, so we're about 10 feet down and we've come into a cavern. Oh, wow. Well. So this would have been where they would have stored all the artillery, I imagine. This yeah. is where all the shells were that they take up to the cannon above. Yeah. There's so nothing in here now, but it's bricked. It's pretty nice brickwork, I have to say. You can probably hear the echo. Yeah. 
and it's got a nice curve. It's actually a really well structured, neat room. Dirt floor, stone floor, and it's totally barren. There's bits of white that you can see the brickwork is red, but there's bits of white. It was obviously painted white. Oh, yeah. It's been whitewashed or something. Whitewashed, yeah. yeah. Cool. It's nice. Uh... Let me take a picture for the show notes so people can see Tim in the. Uh... Hang on, I'll turn my flash on. So if you go to the show notes, I'll show you a picture of Tim down in the. Okay, hold your microphone. There we go. All right, so we're going to go back up ground. We're going to walk around the island to some of the more scenic spots. And when we get to the next spot, Tim is going to tell us an idea for a podcast, his own idea. And we'll continue with a normal episode, but with lots of birds in the background. Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening. I just want to take a quick break to thank today's sponsor, Hover. If you've got an idea for a podcast or a business or anything else, it's almost certain you're going to need a website. You might not need the website now, but you will in the future. And when that time comes, you're going to need a domain name. Now, I can tell you from experience, there's nothing worse when it comes time to register that domain name to find that someone beat you to it, maybe just by a few months or maybe even weeks. So if you've got an idea sitting in the back of your head and you know it's a good one, register your domain name now and do it with Hover. That's who I register my domains with. It's a fantastic service, great prices, really great interface. It's really easy to manage all your domains. All of mine are sitting there in my account. Some of them are now linked to websites. Other ones are kind of like sitting on the bench in a soccer match, waiting for their big moment, waiting to become active. But I've got them. I've got them safe. I know no one else can get it. Hover, I've got all the extensions like .com and .net, but they've also got all the obscure niche ones you might want. Hover's a great service. I'm really pleased to recommend them. And as a special offer to Unmade podcast listeners, if you go to hover.com slash unmade, you're going to get 10% off your first domain name purchases. 10% off hover.com slash unmade. You're also doing us a favor because I know you came from the podcast. By the way, in case my pronunciation of Hover has you foxed. That's H-O-V-E-R, like a hovercraft. Hover.com slash unmade. If you've got that idea, get the domain name. Gives you a bit of peace of mind. And our thanks to Hover for supporting this episode. Let's get back to the show. We've walked around to another part of the island now. I think we're near Rudder Rock. We're in another battery. Tim was comparing it to Call of Duty because we're like in one of those, what do you call them, like sort of a foxhole type thing where you're like looking out through a little slot that the guns would point out. and Like a bunker. Yeah, it's a bunker-like. We also now have a gorgeous view across to the coast of Wales. We can see the city of Cardiff, more birds, blue sky, some lovely billowy clouds in the distance. I guess at this point, Tim, it's worth commenting on the sort of person who comes to an island. I feel like we had a bit of a snapshot of that this morning when we saw the the other people we're sharing the island with. We all yeah. came over on the boat together and I felt like a bit like we were the odd guys out to some extent. Did you feel that way or do you think maybe we weren't? Oh, I don't know. There was a few few sort of young guys like us and stuff and there were a few families and things. They seem like they are wearing hiking gear that's well used. Yeah, there is a certain like preparedness about them they all they all looked more prepared than us we just had like a plastic bag full of stuff we quickly <laughs> grabbed from the grocery store but they all have their like thermoses and their berghouse coats and their hiking boots and they look like you know this is not our first island trip no <laughs> that's right <laughs> this is not their first island and there's like a certain personality type isn't there you know that you can tell they know a lot about birds. Like, they're not just looking at these birds and going, oh, look, seagulls. They're like, oh, that's a yellow-tipped, red-bellied, double-breasted, black-tip-winged cormorant and things like that. They, yeah. they, they know their birds. They know their plants. Apparently, this island's very famous for its plant life. It's got some really unusual and rare plants, and they're probably, you know, getting really excited about that while we're just sort of trampling our way through where we can. It is interesting. I've always been mystified by the bird-watching phenomena, but, um, and I have some friends that, that are bird watchers um, and go to all sorts of, you know, travel to all sorts of places to um, find a particular bird, just to look at it, photograph it, just to see it. But I, and I never quite got it. 
until I was reading an article, and several articles actually, on from a uh, an author I like, um, Jonathan Franzen, very famous author, and he uh, is a bird watcher. And he, he I, I was reading just I guess because he's a great writer. He was talking about the quest and the glory of being outside and going after looking for a bird, and I was totally caught up. So I could read him writing about bird watching more than I could go bird watching. But that book didn't cure you of your dislike of. Our feathered friends. <laughs> I guess it was more about him and the journey and all that sort of stuff. It wasn't so much about the birds. The birds were sort of the, the reason to be out there um, as, a, as a way to, um, you know, cope with life, deal with life, experience and thrill in life. And Is there any animal you like less than birds? I guess I don't. That's a really good question. No. I want to say emus. But <laughs> they're birds. <laughs> Emu. Fair enough. I don't like emus. No one likes emus. The funny thing about emus is they're they're our height. So their heads. You know what I mean? They're sort of their heads are around. There's a very famous moment. I remember being at a place with my mum and extended family at one stage, and an emu just was. I looked across, and my mum and an emu were face to face looking, and then my mum just turns and looks at me. And the emus sort of turned at the same time, like they were having a conversation and they looked up at me. <laughs> and it's one of the funniest things, the, how wide my eye, mum's eyes were. is so funny. Emus are nasty. They're nasty pieces of work. Well, they can lash out. They've got big nails, haven't they? Mm, yeah. And they, and they just look mean. You can, they, you can just tell in their eyes they're thinking of ways to attack you. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So I'm a little bit fascinated by the relationship between, even though these two things don't have a relationship, between Flat Home, which is the island we can see out there, Tim, oh, yeah. with the lighthouse on it, and Steep Home, which we are on. Because obviously Steep Home is more spectacular looking, but Flat Home is obviously easier to inhabit and it's got the lighthouse and I know people are on it more often and I kind of wonder if they're like... I can't decide if I feel like these two islands are friends or like rivals. Like, are they, are they like, you know, two brothers or are they like, you know, I don't know. What are you, what, what are you feeling? Are you getting a vibe? Well, I'm looking at Flat Home and realising now that it has a lighthouse and that, and I think, oh, that's lovely. I'd love to go over there and check out that lighthouse. <laughs> <laughs> Lighthouses are cool, you know. Okay. Was, when you read old famous five books, I was yeah. going into a lighthouse and going up the top and exploring. I tell you what, that would be a good podcast, staying in lighthouses. I actually do often stay in lighthouses. All up and through Devon and Cornwall, there are a lot of lighthouses that now have accommodation built into them or at the bottom in the, in the keeper's cottage. And staying at lighthouses is one of my favourite like weekend break things to do. And that would be a cool podcast. Are they working lighthouses? Some of them are. Some of them are. And some of them have got like fog horns and occasionally there's really loud noises that they, some, some of these cottages will come with earplugs in case the fog horns start going off. And the, the, the light, you, you know, m most of them still have the light working and things like that. I, oh, I love it. I love taking pictures of them. So even in our world of GPS, lighthouses still have an operational value out on the ocean? Yeah, they do. Well, obviously they do. They still run them. Yeah, definitely. Oh, I love a lighthouse. Oh. You're right. Maybe that's it. Maybe Flat Home gets the glory because of the, the lighthouse. But I'm definitely a steep home man. You're always, the grass is always greener on the island next door, isn't it, man? We've come all the way out here to this island. We just look, climbed it, got to the top, looked across. Oh, there's another island that we want to go. <laughs> well, we're over there. Well, it's showing what a great idea my island hopping podcast is. But I, for me, it's always going to be steep home because you know me. I like mountains and I like height and altitude. And steep home has like, you know, a summit which we are going to head towards eventually. So anyway, while we're here admiring flat home and the Welsh coast and all these birds, do you want to share a different idea for a podcast? Have you got, you got one from your, your magic list you want to share with us? I do, actually. This is an idea that um, has nothing to do with islands, but I think might have some real merit. My idea is called Photo Roulette. And what you do with photo roulette is, of course, everyone carries all their photos around with them now because of their phones. And there's a feature, at least on mine, and I'm sure on all the other phones as well, where you can scroll through at great speed across the days and then months and years even, so you can speed through them. So I was thinking about a podcast where you close your eyes and scroll, you know, three or four times on one of those features, months or years, probably years is better. So you cruise right across, up and down or whatever, and then you bang your thumb down on something and then you go in and look at that photo and discuss that photo. What was happening on that day? Who's in the photo? What were the circumstances around it? And that's a podcast idea. So photo roulette. I mean, you wouldn't necessarily do that with the same hosts each time that would be something your guest would do like your guest would bring in their phone do a few swipes and it'd be oh today we've got you no know, we've got tom hanks on the show again 
Tom, can you do the photo relay on your phone? And then he's like, bang. Oh, that's my Uncle Bill. That was when I went for his birthday. Oh, Uncle Bill, what a character he is. Let me tell you a story about him. This picture was taken when I went to his house, which is on the coast of Maine and, you know, things like that. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It could be... Well, you could have a different person each time and they do it with their phone and do something. But, of course, if someone is is really great at talking about and telling stories and you get them back again and again let's play photo roulette again <laughs> and we scroll through and you know what i mean or you could have different people on different ones of course it's another one that has a visual side eventually you need to hmm. put the photo um, mm-hmm. online so people can see it but you could almost do that afterwards as well so the person could describe the photo or maybe not at all maybe it's just the conversation that the photo sparks Mm -hmm. and you never get to see the photo you're going to give us a roulette you're going to give us a go should we do a little demo you're going to tim's tim's got his phone out in his hand at the moment so i'm going to get him to he's he's now got his eyes closed and he's thumb swiping through through the years he's pressed down we're going to zoom in and see oh what have we got photo of i've got my dog oh Oh. (laughs) <laughs> oh, that's am- so, Tim. That's awesome. Tim's staying at my house at the moment, and people who know me well will know that I have a little uh, fawn-coloured Chihuahua named Audrey. And the only other person I've known that had like a dog a bit like that was Tim. When he was young, he had this little tiny dog called Spindles that was half Chihuahua. And uh, he's- no, he's not half Chihuahua. He's half he's half Pomeranian, yeah. and um, and with a little bit of terror. Terrier oh, in him, yeah. well, he kind of looks chihuahua. He, he ca- does. He He's- kind of looked a little bit like Audrey. And we've been talking about that over the last few weeks. And Tim, I make, mean, make, this make, is such an old photo. This obviously isn't a photo you took. This is a, a photo of a photo that's in your phone. That's right. This is probably from the n- late 1980s. Yeah. And it's um, one of those ones where you're going through your photos and you scan them in. I, I scanned this in a long time ago. Like this is back in the section. That's like a famous photo. I know that photo from like knowing you all these because that photo was taken before I ever knew Spindles Spindles has died now but when I knew Spindles he was an old dog Mm. but this is the picture of him as a puppy that you used to show me to say look what Spindles used to look like yeah well I had this on the wall at some stage it makes me so happy to look at this photo it really does that's Spindles and I've been thinking about him all week because I've been hanging with Audrey and she's been jumping around oh yeah that's so cute. Cute dog. And it's it's really funny as well, looking where he's sitting. Like he's sitting on this chair. Uh, sorry, he's sitting rather on this table that was our outdoor table, you know, an outdoor setting. Mm. And just looking at the colours, the blue and white stripes, and that just brings back memories of the backyard as a kid and all that kind of great stuff. Um, yeah. So there we go, Spindles. What a great dog Spindles was. Look at that. That is a cute picture. Why, is your, why was your dog called Spindles? Well, Spindles is... Uh, it comes from a book series by mm. an author called Barry Chant. Mm. And I loved these books. Mm. And Spindles is a character, it's the name of a boy whose who's real name is Timothy, which is another lovely connection when you have a character in a book with your name. Right. But his nickname is Spindles. And, um, and he lives on an outback station in a, the Australian outback. And he, has, he goes off on his horse during the day and he, has, he off to this sort of deserted creek area and he has all these friends. There's an emu called Hippie who's a really lovely emu, not mm. a scary emu, mm. emu like in your mind. Mm. But um, he has all these wonderful animals, Tank the Goanna and Roo the Kangaroo. But around them all is this um, big wise tree called Red Gum. Yeah. And Red Gum gives advice about <laughs> the way, all the lessons that Spindle's learning in his life. And it's a beautiful, awesome oh, yeah. stories. Yeah. And I love them so I love them so much that I um that I named my dog Spindles. <laughs> I remember the character Spindles in the book is co- is nicknamed Spindles because he has quite spindly thin legs. That's right. And yes. did, did, did you and your dog Spindles had quite thin legs, but there's no connection there. You just you just loved the name Spindles from the book and you just called you could have had any animal and you would have called it Spindles. You would have called a goldfish Spindles if you could. That's right. That's right. right. It yeah. was just like this is my favorite character. I could have called it Tintin or something like that yeah, because yeah. I just love Tintin so much as well, but yeah, it was just a fam- favorite character. Did I do a roulette? Yeah. Yeah, do it, do it. All right, I'm doing. I've got my phone in my hand now. I'm thumbing up and down through the years, and I'm stopping here. Oh no, <laughs> my phone, my pictures are all in the cloud. <laughs> and oh, are you seriously not downloading? And we're on a desert island. <laughs> so, There's hang, nothing. Hang on, if I go into, um, if I, I think there is a little bit of 4G here. So I've switched on my. I'll see if we get 4G here in this military bunker in the middle of the channel. I've got a bit of 3G. Let's see if I can get the picture. I know it's from December 2008. Are you going to wait for this one to come up in particular? Yeah, it's, it's the one that Fate chose. All right, yeah. all right. Buffering. Buffering. While I think your podcast idea is good, maybe it's not good for Desert Islands. 
<laughs> where you have where you have no connectivity. So you don't have them sitting there at all, or even see mine are all sitting there. If I wanted to click on it and look at it properly, or for, yeah, it would even, then download all the. Yeah, that's true. There's not even a thumbnail, which surprises me. Thumbnail. It? That's what I'm thinking. Of. Yeah. All right, Tim. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna ditch that one. I'll favourite it, so we'll find out what it was later. Maybe. Oh, okay. That's good. But let be. me see if I can go to, to more modern times where there might actually be a thumbnail. Okay, here we go. There's some colour there. They're all scrolling. All right, here we go. I'm going here. Bang. Okay, this is this is a picture of a friend of mine called Amanda who's sitting on a plane because Amanda's an astronomer and we flew together to China to make a video about a solar eclipse because the solar eclipse of 2009, the path of it happened to go over the University of Nottingham's campus in China. So I used that as an excuse to tell the university, well, you should send me to the eclipse to go and film it. So I went with Amanda, the astronomer, who was like, you know, the star of the videos. Yeah. And we and we flew over to observe the eclipse. So this is just a picture I took of Amanda sitting in her seat on the plane on the flight over. Is it on the flight or you're about to take off? Or We're about, it's, uh, I think we're already, we've already taken off. And then like, you know, a day or two later, we were in China watching the eclipse. I tell you what, seeing a solar eclipse, that's a podcast. Every time a solar eclipse happens, doing a podcast about that because there are eclipse chasers who make sure they go to every eclipse that happens. Sometimes you only get one a year or not, or two a year, or none a year. So it would be a very occasional podcast, but doing a podcast of each eclipse would be quite good fun as well. So what do you think? Photo roulette. This is a thing that can work definitely as a podcast. I think it's also a it's good dinner table conversation, like with people I and like stuff. It. Pull out your phone, I, scroll through you're right. your eyes closed, bang, tell us You're right, that. you're right. It's also a good game to do at the dinner table. I mean, this obviously appeals to me. I, I do a series on one of my YouTube channels called Objectivity where every few episodes at the Royal Society – we close our eyes and open up the catalogue drawers for the Royal Society and just pull out a card at random with your eyes shut and whatever card we pull out, we then go into the vaults and the archives and make a video about that item. Like, so fate just decides what the item is. Oh, so, so this clearly great. appeals to my brain. It's a very, it's sort of a similar, a similar idea in some ways. So. Yeah. Very nice. Here we go. Nice photo roulette. So whoever you are listening at the moment, take out your phone, sort of scroll to the bigger picture. So maybe, you know, you're going over months and years with a single swipe. And no cheating. No cheating. Do a bit of uppy downy swipiness. Whack a photo. Have a look at it and think about what it what was going on at the time. Maybe even you can go into our Reddit and tell us if you want. But yeah. You're right. That would be a good game to do with friends. Like I, I enjoyed just doing it then, like saying saying to you, oh, look, there's my friend Amanda and we went to see Eclipse. And yeah, you're right. There's, it's a good way to kind of reminisce and tell stories about your life with your friends, but in a really arbitrary way. It's also a great way to enjoy your photos from years ago. You know, we take a lot of photos, probably too many photos these days because they're with... And, and it's funny because they're with us all the time. So you've always got your photo album. And so there's a way of enjoying them again is often you might kill time just scrolling through and smiling. But this is a yeah. way of actually going right back. And and, well, and photos you'd never look at. Like that picture of a man. Like the picture you came up with, Spindles, is like an iconic photo from your life to the yeah. point where it used to be on your wall. But that one of Amanda, like it's actually a bit out of focus. It's a terrible photo. It was just one I took for fun and then like probably thought nothing of again. That's like a moment in time that really was supposed to have been forgotten. And yet it's like, it's come back to life. I remember taking it. I think I'd just gone to the bathroom and I was walking back down the aisle and I just said, oh, I'll take a picture of you while I'm standing up in the aisle. And like, obviously I remember the moment of the eclipse. It was such a big deal. But the moment of just sitting on like the boring flight and just hanging out for 12 hours, that, that kind of stuff gets forgotten. But it's, no, why should it be forgotten? The, you could also investigate the photo even more. Like if I was to say, okay, on that flight... What films did you watch? Hmm. Does, can you remember? No, I don't even remember if we watched films. Or no, a my, book? Because sometimes you're located, oh, that was when I read this or I saw this or I remember this incident happened where the lady poured, you know, the hostess know. poured accidentally no. wine on my lap or, you know what I mean? Like there's no, some. Nothing. I don't remember anything about that flight except taking that photo. I remember the seats were a little bit uncomfortable and the, the plane was quite full. I remember when we got to the airport, it was during a time when there was some health scare going on in the world. And when you walked in through the China airport, they had all these heat sensor cameras on everyone who was walking into the airport. So if, so, so if someone was like glowing on the thermal imaging camera, they would know that person had a fever and was sick and would be taken aside. Oh, so, wow. so if you were like trying to hide the fact you were sick, I remember they had cameras there to... To, catch, to pull you out so you couldn't like be sick and sneak into the country. And the other thing I remember was that the, the driver that was supposed to pick us up from the airport wasn't there and we had to go a really long way to, to where we were going and I couldn't get anyone on the phone and I only spoke English and it was really hard for me to arrange. I had to like 
try and figure out how to get a taxi, which would cost a fortune, across to this place that was hours away in China. But I sorted it out. But I don't remember the flight. There we go. There Sorry. we go. <laughs> there you go. Look but at it that. leads to stories, doesn't it? It's like, yeah, oh, I I'm, I'm, I'm dredging up every single memory from that trip. So the thermal imaging camera is an interesting memory. But All right, man. Shall we, shall we continue our little journey around Steep Home the Island? And when we get to the next stop, I'll, uh, I'll come up with another podcast idea. Let's do it. We are, we're literally under attack. Oh, man. Oh, jeez. <laughs> the birds are attacking us. We must be near their nests. How can we, how can we get out of here, then? We've got to keep going. Why? Got, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen seagulls do this. They're protecting their babies. Look out. <laughs> <laughs> They're sweeping low. We're obviously near some nesting grounds. That's where we want to go. There's the trig point. We're approaching the highest point on Steep Home, 256 feet. It's basically just on a plateau across the top of the island with lots of kind of scrubby bushland here. There's a trig point used for measuring, so we'll stop at the trig point and do a bit of recording if we can. But What's a trig point? So a trig point or a trigonometry point, these things are scattered all over the country. Yeah. They have them in Australia too, where they look different. And these are used by surveyors. So when they're doing, when they're measuring distances and elevations and heights and that, and one person has to stand at point A and another person has to stand at point B and you measure all the angles and things like that, yeah. the trig point is one of the points you stand at, right. plotted on a map. So it becomes just like a, a reference point of known height and location. This is the summit, is it? This is as high as it gets on Steep Home. Well, it would be a picturesque location if it wasn't for all the seagulls overhead that are <laughs> most displeased with our presence. They are. It's full on. But here you can see both sides of the channel. We can sort of see the full 360 panorama. Now over there, on one side, we can see Carter, Flat Home, all the Bristol Channel stretching inland towards the centre of England. And then if we look across the other side of the island, we're looking further down the channel out to sea out to the Atlantic. Oh, it's a beautiful view. Tim is waving his hat above his head the whole time because he's worried about getting swooped. But I reckon if we just stay still here for a while, they'll get used to us and see us as less of a threat. I don't. I think they'll see us as an easy target. <laughs> <laughs> they already see us as that. So obviously here up in the, all this sort of flat scrubland, I'll take a picture of this, people, so if you go to the show notes, you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. Obviously here in all these bushes and all this land, there's obviously a bunch of nests and babies, I'm imagining. So they're like... They're just guarding all that. All right, so time for an idea from me. My idea for a podcast... You're not going to get swooped, man, don't worry. No, I know. No, we're all good. No, we're good. I can see they're calming down now. They are calming down it's a bit. Good. So my idea for a podcast... I haven't got a good name for it yet. Let's call it Mode of Communication. Right. And the idea here is that every episode features a different way of voice communication so i'm thinking ham radio cb radio old telegraphs walkie talkies different types of telephones radios into space all, all all ways that you can communicate a voice and each episode is about a different one but the novelty is you also record it on that type of communication all right so the walkie talkie episode would be recorded by the two podcasters using two ends of a walkie talkie because usually you can find some of this old technology somewhere in use like an old telegraph or an old style phone and things like that so you say today we're going to feature this old type of analog phone yeah and we're going to record the episode on that type of phone so when you listen to it you could also do today's episode is all about cassettes or vinyl records or things like that and you record it in that way i'm not talking about selling vinyl records of a podcast which is something i have some experience with but that you would record it onto vinyl and then play the vinyl recording as, as a podcast and things like that so every episode not only is about a different way of communicating voice it showcases that way of communicating voice that's a good idea that's a good idea and you could put the uh get the sound effects of dropping the needle and hearing the sound of the vinyl going around and then yeah. and then there's the podcast yeah. yeah I love the idea of uh, one recorded on walkie talkies I also like the idea of trying to record a podcast episode between two people who are at, op are at opposite ends of you know those tins you connect with, str <laughs> with string when you're yeah. a kid so yeah. that, that would be quite a technical challenge but I'm sure you could rig up kind of 
microphones inside the tin and say, today's episode is being recorded between <laughs> two tins connected by 20 metres of string. Who hasn't done that, hey? I mean, that's amazing. I, I don't think I have. Is oh, that, really? No. Oh, right. No, I remember seeing it in an encyclopedia, like a kid's encyclopedia yeah. of things to make and do. Yeah. And I definitely did it. It was not very satisfactory in its results. No. So it wouldn't make for a good podcast. If you're, if you're more than a few metres away, I think you're going to be struggling. Okay. There we go. I like that one. I like that one. I thought you might like that one too, being a bit of a, you know, having a long, a long and interesting history with audio, you know, being someone who always was into music and buying his cassettes and vinyl and things like that. I like you could do a Morse code episode. <laughs> For novelty value, yeah, surely. Yeah. But or you, it could be tapping along in the background as you speak. Yeah. 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 That's a fast. Yeah, it is a fascinating idea. Real to real. Real to real is actually the name of a podcast idea on my list of ideas, which would be an entire podcast that was going to be just filmed on real to real. But I'd absorb it into my communication mode, maybe. Oh yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so you would also you could get in an expert. You could do a bit of a history on it. Uh, when did vinyl start? When did it cease? Why has it had a renaissance? All that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting with something like, I was thinking the other day about my old iPod, which is in the drawer, which is sort of, it's not really a mode of communicate, but it's in the similar vein. Yeah, you could do it. Yeah. The MP3 and the way it's on an iPod. And I was thinking how obsolete, how quickly the iPod was obsolete. It came, revolutionized everything, and then suddenly we had phones. Yeah. And it was only about a five, six year sort of window that it was... Um, well, it was absorbed into the phone, wasn't it? I mean, your phone still is an iPod, but it's still an MP3 player, but... Yeah. Well, that's right. Yeah, yeah. It's just become, uh, well, the actual object itself though I've still got it home with that little click wheel the click wheel was so awesome yeah, yeah. and then it's redundant yeah I like the idea of a special episode like you could do one where you talk to people in space like on the space station oh wow yeah that, that kind of stuff can be arranged if you're if you're organized if your podcast was successful enough they might help you out because sometimes the people in the space station do communicate with ham radio people so oh really uh, yeah incredible what else could you do what, what else a, is there what's the language that you use in um, CB radio, you know, the... the um, like the kind Victor of... Victor Charlie Charlie, Mike Sierra Foxtrot. Yeah. Well, has What's that language like, called? A kind of, yeah, the military one. The military language. I mean, that's yeah. letter by letter. So yeah, I don't, I don't think so what the whole podcast would be. How are you going today there, Tango India Mike? <laughs> well, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thing. Well, Morse code is like that, although a little bit quicker. I remember when I worked at the BBC, I did a... When I was working for the website, I did a feature all about Morse code. And, you know, who still uses it and things like that. And I went and saw this Morse code enthusiast who lived out in the countryside. And I did a story with him. And I did an interview and took photos and made it a feature on the BBC website. But because I was a bit of a nerd and I loved doing things a bit different, I also made a second version of the article written all in Morse code. (laughs) And at the bottom of the article, it said, press here to see this article in Morse code. And if you pressed it, a clone of that BBC page came up. But the whole article was rewritten all all in Morse code. (laughs) That's nice. I remember sending it to my boss thinking he'd be really impressed. And the reply just said, you're bonkers. (laughs) 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 Which I took as a compliment. (laughs) Yeah, 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 that's great. But they did it, so that's cool. They did it, they let me do it. Did you ever, were you into walkie-talkies as a young'un? Yeah, I did. I mean, I'm an only child, so I didn't have a sibling <laughs> to walkie-talkie. So there was a lot no. of one-sided conversation. Are you there? Over? <laughs> I remember I used to do that. And one, I, and, and all my life of owning a walkie-talkie, there was one time when I went on the walkie-talkie and said, is anyone there? And like a boy from a few streets away answered and we spoke for like a few minutes. And oh, it was wow. it was amazing. And I thought, oh, I've got a new friend. This is going to be like a big thing. And I never, ever spoke to him again or heard from him again. <laughs> He could have been, perhaps he was in space. Maybe it was, was one of those rare times it was coming from. <laughs> it was someone on the space shuttle. He was just pretending to be a kid a few streets over. <laughs> that's, that's, hello, Brady. <laughs> <laughs> There's a novelty value in this. There's an enthusiast angle to it. There's the history yeah. angle to it. This could be a bit of fun. The reason this podcast has a half-decent chance of success too is that the sort of people who are really into communication and voice communication and things like that I can imagine might actually be a little bit into podcasts as well and they're a little bit tech savvy so so the problem is if you're making a podcast about something like knitting a lot of your constituency might be older people who don't well listen to podcasts whereas if you are making a podcast about electronic communication and technology and geekery like that I'm hoping there's a fair chance these are the sort of people that will be listening to and sharing podcasts wow that bird so nearly swooped you yeah I know I know I don't think it was attacking you though because it didn't make any noise. I think it just happened to be close. Just likes me. Yeah. It Looks like that's a nest over there on the ground. Yeah. We won't be going over there. No, no, <laughs> no. 
This is where we need a CB, a CB radio to go down to the other folks. Can we have some, <laughs> some decoys, please? Yeah, some Over. We need to call in some artillery. Let's try it back up. <laughs> We're under attack. If, if you do think Tim has seemed a little uninterested in my idea, he's not being rude. He is seriously keeping an absolute vigil of all these seagulls the whole time I'm talking. <laughs> I've never thought, I've always thought of seagulls as being the most benign bird no, ever. Oh, have you ever seen them fight over a chip? No, but over a chip. But they stand <laughs> patiently and whinge nearby. It's not like they come and attack you. Um, we're, on, we're on their turf now, man. This is like, you don't you normally walk into their baby zone. We are the chip. We are the, we are the chip. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds really philosophical, like I am the walrus. <laughs> we are the chip. If you don't know where the chip is, you're the chip. You are the chip. <laughs> That's right. This whole island is just one big bag of chips. It is like, it's like most of the seagulls have stopped flying now, but they're all just sitting in the bushes and on top of trees just looking at us, waiting for our next move. They are. Vultures couldn't look more predatory than these guys do. <laughs> they are. They don't like us, that's for sure. For amusement's sake, I'm going to do your idea here as well so that you can... <laughs> <laughs> so that you can't have a break from it. Instead of walking somewhere safer, while we're here at the trig point on top of Steep Home, under constant threat from seagull attack. Well, we may as well record a podcast while we're here because we're never leaving. I'm not moving. <laughs> like, like, running the gauntlet back down the hill again is going to be scary. Imagine if we were found here, like, pecked to death and, like, the, the, <laughs> and the investigators just found this, like, re- Zoom recorder rolling with two microphones and they're like, how did these guys die? What did they do? <gasps> Look at this, officer. I think we've got their answer here, and they could play it all back. (laughs) This is our black box voice record. All right. All right, listen. Yeah, no, look, I do have another idea, and Mm. it has nothing to do with birds uh, and had nothing to do with the island. However, this experience may turn into uh, an idea for this podcast. My uh, podcast idea is called That Story You Tell. Yeah. The premise is that everyone has a story that they tell. And it's the first story cab off the rank in a storytelling situation. It's like the story equivalent of your favourite pair of underwear. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Right. It's your go-to story at dinner parties. You you know you'll get a laugh. You know it's sparkling and interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And if you have people that you know well and you're around regular friends, you know at the first word when one of your friends is starting their story and you've heard it a million times, (laughs) it's like, oh, here we go. Or even you can hear someone else telling a story vaguely related to golf and you know that Bill's golf story is coming out next and you can see him in his chair he's getting ready to yeah. tell it. You know, just... this, is, this is the story your wife has heard a million times that's right, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. I also have jokes like that as well like every time we're at a restaurant and the, the waiter says, oh, would you like to try the wine first? And I have a sip. I used to have this joke where I'd take a sip and go, oh, it's disgusting, like, as a joke. <laughs> like, like, yeah, and although I haven't done it for 10 years, I can't, I can't have a sip of the test, the tester sip of wine now without my wife giving me the look. You're going to do it, aren't you? I can tell you, I can tell you're going to do it. <laughs> That's right, yeah. That's a really good idea. I mean, people coming on to this podcast to tell that story they tell are obviously going to have to have some degree of self-awareness that this is my story I've told way too many times but I think we're all self-aware enough to do that that's right yeah, or they're coaxed on by um, <laughs> by a friend or a partner that's right go and tell them that story and like, oh that is a good and usually they won't need much coax no <laughs> it's, like story. it's like oh that is a great story I think you don't really have one though do you you normally have like a suite of three or four like depending on the situation and like you know but... yeah 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 and it's actually really hard to think of them when I was thinking about this idea I was thinking oh so what's my story or stories and it's one came to mind I might share that in a minute but the you know what I mean like it's I'm sure I've got lots of stories yeah. that come out of experiences things I've done with you that were lots of fun or funny things that happened or coincidences but yeah, it's hard to think of them without a context that triggers them that's true and also quite often that story you always tell isn't necessarily your story. Sometimes it's something that once happened to a mate of mine. And like I've got a few things that happened to mates of mine that are way better stories than have ever happened to me. Mm. And I wheel those ones out all the time, like, and they become better in the telling. I have a friend that does that. He also sometimes, like, the story morphs over time where it becomes his story. And I was once, <laughs> I was once, I was once at the 
pub and he started telling the story of something that happened to him and halfway through I realised it happened to me and it was my story <laughs> and he forgot that he'd stolen it from me oh. and halfway through I said, Michael, that's my story. And then he looked at me and realised completely and he went, oh my God, I'm so sorry, you're right. I've, I've been stealing that story for years and I forgot it was yours. Dude, so he wasn't he wasn't being deceptive. He just, it had morphed into his collective memory and he was telling the story like, I remember a story and it just remembers it so well it's happened to him. I actually think he deep down knew it wasn't his story but he didn't know who he'd stolen it from and he'd been caught with his fingers in the story cookie jar. <laughs> it's too good a story to pull back. Yeah. <laughs> and he just looked at me really sheepish. Like he didn't even try and like w- w- wiggle out of it. He was like, oh, you're right, you got me. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Go on then. What's 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 a that story you always tell? Oh uh, well, I'm not even sure it's that story. Uh, this is one thing where you don't know yourself. You just think of what a good story is, but others may be able to say to you, "No, you. That's not it. That you know, it's that other one you tell." Yeah. But anyway, this is the only one that came to mind when I was thinking of this. It's a sort of a curious story in a way. I was. It, it starts off in my hairdresser and then it goes somewhere else. Hmm. I was at my hairdresser. I, I, was, I was at a new hairdresser. This is years ago. And we were getting to know each other and chatting and all that. What are you going to do with your hair and what's going on with your hair and all that? And I said, oh, look, the usual conversation, I want to cut it, you know, so it looks stylishly good and I don't have to do a lot to it and don't feel like I'm spending ages on it in the morning. And I was riding a scooter at that time, like a little, you know, motorbike. So I was wearing a helmet and all that sort of stuff. And he goes, nah, don't be, you know, come on, have a bit of imagination, you know. And he says, and so we had this back and forward and I said, I don't know, I I felt weird and pretentious being too imaginative and descriptive about my hair because it's cooler to say you don't really care about your hair. Yeah. But then he sort of pushed me and he says, okay, if you could have anyone's hair, who would it be? And I thought for a moment and pretty quickly it came out, Morrissey. Like, uh, Morrissey has awesome hair. Right. And I'm like, I, I would look like Morrissey. So he says, all right, playfully, let's give you the Morrissey. And I'm like, well, this is ridiculous. I don't look anything like Morrissey. And, yeah. you know, so he gave me this haircut and I was like, I don't think that's Morrissey. He goes, no, we've got to give it a few months, you know, we'll come back and we'll work on it some more. And I'm like, okay. It was kind of a fun thing. I walk in, give me the Morrissey and away yeah. we go. Yeah. Several months later, I was over in New York City and I was walking through Greenwich Village really late at night looking for a place called The Bitter End, a classic coffee shop where Bob Dylan used to play. And I walk in there and I go up to order a drink and this girl at the bar uh, counter turns around to me and says oh my god you look so much like Morrissey (laughs) (laughs) it was the most satisfying moment of my life (laughs) I can't believe it nice so anyway I got a a picture with this girl who called me Morrissey we got a selfie together and I sent it back to my hairdresser and said success you've done it well done (laughs) great achievements I've become uh, quite loyal to him for his what I consider to be his monumental achievement. That is. I, t- I wonder if he tells that story. I get the feeling he has many victories, and this okay. would be merely a small victory for him, but it's been a, a glorious one for me. It, it, it perpetuates me living in some kind of delusion that I have hair a bit like Morrissey. <laughs> Who, who's your current hairstyle based on? Or are you currently, is this the, current, is this the Morrissey one I'm looking <laughs> this at? This is the Morrissey one. Mor- <laughs> What are you saying? <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah. This was some years ago, sorry. but it's, well, it's not, I mean, it's just sort of a it's kind of wavy short back and sides, really. There's nothing too dramatic about it. Thankfully, Morrissey's like 20 years older than me, so he's he's getting older and I'm yeah. catching up, which is I know. suitably um, helpful for me. But The funny thing is Morrissey goes to his hairdresser and asks for a Tim. Yeah, I'm sure he does. <laughs> That's right. Tim from Tim and Brady. <laughs> So it's yeah, that's a that's a story I tell. I've never heard that story. Oh really? You've heard all the stories I tell lots of times, probably more than anyone on earth besides my wife. And also probably people who listen to this podcast and other media I produce have probably heard all my best stories already because I've done too many podcasts. But do you know what? One of my favorite stories to tell and I use it all the time, and I use it like for quite altruistic, motivational reasons, Mm. is a story about you. And it's a story I tell all the time. Oh, no. Here we go. (laughs) And the story is, and it's usually a story I tell about being rewarded for being brave and giving things a go. Because back towards the end of high school, Tim and I went to a school with quite small classes, and we had an end-of-year kind of swimming carnival there's like a swimming carnival co- competition between the different houses at school who's the best who's the best swimmer and at the time tim was also like the the captain of the of the school 
sort of sports team because he, he was like the leader and therefore he had to set a good example and enter everything. Well, it was made clear to me I was chosen as this captain, not for my sporting prowess, prowess <laughs> but for my organisational ability. Yeah, exa- exactly. It was more of a leadership role. So like, in all fairness to Tim, he's, he's not like a... He's not like a He's fine, but he's not like a really blessed athlete. And that, that's kind of that's kind of part of the, the story. Is he wasn't like a, a particularly strong athlete, and he definitely wasn't a particularly strong swimmer. That's an understatement. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, it was the swimming carnival because we had quite a small class. All the races only had like a handful of males in it, and also there weren't many boys in the class, and we we're all pretty proud and stuff like. That. So we did like the freestyle, and like five or six of us entered it, and I, I'm sure Tim came near last and then and then we did like backstroke and breaststroke and a few people entered and I entered some of these races and I think Tim came pretty near last in all the races but because there weren't many people in it and you got points Tim was accruing points for his team and doing the right thing and you know being a good leader for the sports team (laughs) and then the final race that had to be swum was the butterfly and the butterfly is a really difficult stroke to do as as most people know and none of the boys were willing to do it because we didn't want to look foolish in front of all the school who were sitting in the stands and things like that so there was no one to enter the butterfly race but Tim because he was you know he was brave and was willing to give it a go and didn't care what people would think and wanted to do the right thing for the sports team said, I'll do the butterfly, I don't care what people think of me. But they didn't want to put him in the pool on his own. <laughs> so they put him in the girls race <laughs> on, a, on, a, on a lane all on his own. And it just so happened that a few of the girls in our age group were very good swimmers, like, like competitive swimmers, so they were really good. So all the, all the girls and Tim get on the starting blocks and they fire the starter's gun or whoever the races were starting, blew a whistle, and they all jumped in. And these girls went streaming down the pool, mag- <laughs> magnificent swimmers finishing in like near record time. And, t- and seriously, Tim looked like he was drowning. Well, I think I was near the ground. <laughs> as, he, as he found it in the water and like co- coughed and spluttered and did something vaguely. I'm sure he would have been disqualified if we were being really strict about the butterfly. But anyway, he made it to the other end and he came first. You know, he, was f- he got the first ribbon. He was the first male to finish. And he, and he got the, whatever amount of points you got for finishing first as the first male butterfly swimmer. And because he'd accrued enough points in those earlier races and he got a first and no one was in that race, he actually accrued enough points to become the swimming champion. And when they did the points at the end and they had to give out the medal for, like, you know, the year 12 swimming, male swimming champion for the year, and we're all like, oh, I wonder who's going to win that is Tim Hine with, with X number of points. And you got up the front and you got your, I don't know if they gave you a trophy or a medal or whatever. It's a medal. I've forgotten all about yeah. this. Yeah, and yeah. you were like, you were like the swimming champion. And like, and you make all the jokes you want and I can sit here and laugh at you coughing and spluttering. But because you were brave and you didn't care what people thought and you were willing to give it a go, you got a medal. And like all these years later... No one remembers that you like coughed and spluttered down the pool, except everyone listening to the other <laughs> podcast. And everyone you've told, yeah, like everyone told. But you got the medal, and you were the you were the champion, and no one can take that away from you. And I love telling that as a story to people who are scared to do things because they worry about what people think. You know, if you give it a go, you can be a champion. And I I tell that story about you all the time. Oh, that's lovely. I I had forgotten all about that. The stories we tell. Yeah, oh, that's that story you tell. My grandmother had one that you remember well. Your gram. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because she, 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 when she was a very young young woman, she was out for someone having a. Um, it was like a dinner, and this guy ordered wine, and he was really pretentious, and they brought out the wine. Oh, it's funny. It's about tasting wine again. I didn't even think of that. And he would he would bring out this. The wine was brought out to this guy, and he tasted it, and then he he sent it back, insisting that it be half a degree cooler, that the <laughs> wine was cooled by half a degree. My nan told that story so many times that Tim knows that story. I do, I do. <laughs> As I, like, whenever you think of my nan, you, t- you think of Nan's story. That's right, that's right. Yeah, mm. I know that story from her telling it, and I know it from your mum telling it about her. Yeah. And nan tells that story, and I know it yeah. from you telling it. Yeah. There we go. Great idea. Great idea, Tim. So nice everyone's one. got a story. Yeah, yeah. This is another one where I'd love people to go to our subreddit and let us know what your story is. Mm. Keep it to like... Six or seven sentences, maybe? Like, if you go there and write, like, a wall of text. In fact, here's a question. Is that story you tell always a good story? Or are they... Or is it, like, people recounting their dreams or boring stories? Like, is that story you tell, by definition, a good story worth telling? Because it's... You you know, you've chosen the wheat from amongst the chaff. Or are they still sometimes really boring stories that you just tell too often? (laughs) 
That's right. You can have it. People have a story. They're going to tell this story now. Yeah. And you know, uh, this is not a great story, but they love telling the story. They love this. The story's their story. Here's another question. When you're with like friends and family and people who have those stories and they start telling it to you and they forgot that they've already told you, do you tell them, oh, I've heard this one, mate? Or do you just let them go like, and, and laugh again and hear the story again? Like, I must do it to you all the time. I must, every time you see me, I must tell you stories you've heard before. Do you call me on it or do you just like pretend to have not have heard it? Or? No, I go with it. I go yeah. with it. I'm polite. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. No, no, not just with you. I mean, <laughs> like you've asked me that question before. And I'm just answering it again. <laughs> So, Tim, what do you do when, if you've heard the story before? And <laughs> Interesting question, Brady. Oh, you're throwing some curlers at me today. I think you tend to over-nod while they're telling the story. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, you know? to get it done quickly. <laughs> it's sort of subconscious, but you've got to let them tell the story again because I think often they know they've told you the story before, and but they're... They just they work, their mouth won't stop. Like yeah. <laughs> it's this muscle memory. <laughs> your, 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 your tongue and lips and throat remember the story so well it just happens as a reflex. I get paranoid about that though. I was going to say most of that story you always tells do often begin with stop me if I've told you this before <laughs> or I've probably told you this one before. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, there's a lot of that goes on. Sometimes you have like stories like that. Like I have, you know, I have a few of my favourite stories and my wife's heard them a million times. And sometimes we'll be at a dinner party and the do- as you were alluding to earlier, the door is suddenly left wide open for your story, <laughs> right? And like this is, this is your moment. But sometimes if I'm feeling a bit introverted or I just don't feel like telling the story, it becomes awkward because the story is there to be told. And my wife turns to me with that look. And then she'll say, Brady's got a great story yeah. about that. Or she'll say, go on, Brady, you've got to tell that story. And then like, I'm like, I'll look at her and think, oh, I don't really want to tell her. And I'll sort of, I don't think it's a very good story or I'm not in the mood. Mm. And, she, and then I'll say, why don't you just tell it? And then she, oh. and then, and then, so then she will like, she's kind of in a difficult situation. So she'll start telling it. But then halfway through, you suddenly think, no, no, you're telling it you're all wrong. It, yeah. <laughs> and, and you always end up like jumping on halfway through anyway. So, so sometimes your wife will start that story you always tell and then you you bring it home. That's right. That's right. That's totally right. And because they always tell it from the wrong perspective. Like they're not in the story. They're sort of describing it. It's like, well, what happens is Brady says that he, you know, or you know what I mean? Like they're sort of describing it like an onlooker. Yeah. You're like, oh, come on. You haven't got energy. The pace is all wrong. Oh, they haven't, they haven't they told a, it. They miss a crucial detail. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's like, you've got to get inside the story. <laughs> there are some people that have those stories they always tell that they tell badly. Like I've got, <laughs> we have a friend who is no doubt listening to this podcast, <laughs> who is a very dear friend of ours. Yeah. He tells good stories badly yeah. because he's a real details man. He's a details man in life and he loves putting every single detail into the story. It's like, and like probably you and me who are more like storytellers, raconteurs, I like to think. Oh, yeah. we, we've learned what details to leave out, what lies to tell, what little, em- <laughs> what little embellishments are okay. But he's like, he won't tell a lie or embellish. So he, he'll tell every single detail of the story to the point I've heard some of them so many times. In fact, we were with him recently, yeah. weren't we? And he was about to tell this story to you. And I was like, you know, we, whenever he starts to tell a story, we joke to him, like he knows we joke about this. We'll say, oh no, you know, hang on, let me go and get a cup of tea. <laughs> and he was about to start telling you this story. And I said, oh man, you can't, don't, don't tell Tim this story. It's gonna take forever. And he's, <laughs> and he's like, but he's like, it has to take forever. That's how the story, and I said to him, Man, I could tell that story better than you in about 40 seconds. And he said, you could not. And, and then he said, go on, then do it. So I turned to Tim and told his story in like 40 seconds. And Tim like laughed and said, oh, it's a good story. And then we looked back at him and he said like, wow, that actually was like loads better. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he's learned from that. Like, <laughs> and I said to him afterwards, see, I left this out and that out and this out. And he's like, oh, yeah. The but details. I, I bet he still tells the long version though. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Well, it's in, the part of the story is the enjoyment of telling the story as well. Yeah. He is great company for that because he, he loves you know, he, he knows that he does it and it's great. Oh, he loves it. He loves yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he has heaps of stories too. He does. He, he does, does have good stories. Yeah. <laughs> Legend. <laughs> All right. Very good idea, Tim. I, this is a podcast I would love. This is a podcast made for having guests on as well. Because half of the challenge of a podcast is thinking, how can I get the best out of my guest? How can I get the best stories and anecdotes? And here, the whole premise you've created is, come on the show, don't tell me anything boring, just give me your gold. That's right. Yeah, that's right. The one story. Here it is. So, 
Are we, are we going to finish our story on this island now and try and get away from all these seagulls? Well, this, this is going to be a story, isn't it? <laughs> it's probably not the one we're going to tell every time. At the time we got ambushed by seagulls running to the, what is it, the trig point? It's a trig point, yep. The trig point, which is sort of something, it's about four foot high and it's square and it's a bit like a, our, our, a concrete edifice. Our recorder is literally sitting on top of the trig point while we hold the microphones. So, Tim, here are, here are our choices, here are our options. Go back the way we came. Yeah. Which, you know, obviously was pretty challenging and we got swooped. We could go back that way to the other end of the island and loop around. But with, that means we're going to have to walk where all those birds are sitting in trees, which means they've probably got nests in all those trees there. Yeah. Or... Some of those birds have machine guns, I can tell. I actually think maybe we have to go back the way we came. I think we do too. At least we know we got that way without being struck. That's right. Once. That's right. I haven't done much to help you get over your fear of birds today, have I? I think, if anything, I've, like, reinforced it or it's not exacerbated fear, it. It's not a fear of birds. <laughs> it's, it's a dislike of birds. I'm not scared of them. I mean, it's unpleasant to be swooped, and I don't want to Is that like swoop. saying, I, I'm not afraid of ghosts, I dislike them? <laughs> That's right. Like, yeah, I'm good friends with them. We just don't get along. All right. <laughs> That's right. All right. Let's well, do it. Let's, let's do that, and then we're going to go back and have some lunch and enjoy the rest of our day here on Steep Home. Have a look at the uh, show notes, everyone, for more details about Steep Home and pictures and things like that. And it's been a good day. It's been fun, this. It's been, I've liked it. Have you liked it? Oh, yeah. No, this is cool. But if, we, if you don't hear from us, like if there's no follow-up to this particular podcast... Mm. Send a search party. That's right. <laughs> Tell them to go yeah. to the trig point. Go to the trig point. That's where we left our black box. <laughs> That's right. For people listening, by the way, it's not like we're near the nests. We're not like going to step on them or anything. We're on, we're on a pathway that we are supposed to walk on. Like we're on a clearly marked public path. We are not doing the wrong thing. The seagulls don't seem to be appreciating that fact, though. Is this where we go left? Yeah, go down there, yeah. Whoa! Whoa! Whoa. 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 <laughs> <laughs> ah! <laughs> Stop! Get off! No, you're okay, there's no one near you. That's your, that's your hat. <laughs>